The garden is an open, inclusive, Christ-like community. Where people from many paths gather to explore, engage, and seek inspiration. To transform our world through the unconditional love of God. Explore. Engage. Inspire. We're glad you're here. Hello gardeners, it's a joy to be with you today. Our prayer is that you will experience the love of God in and among our community of faith. Just a couple of things I'd like to highlight. First, if you've not seen the communication, our GLT and myself are looking at the trends in the state of Indiana and have decided to hold off on moving back to in-person worship for a while. But you know, this online thing seems to be working for folks. So if you could do us a favor and just go ahead and share the garden with all those you know, we pray that folks will find comfort in this time uh, in and among our community of faith. Again, thank you for your continued support and we ask for God's blessing on you and your family during this time. Welcome, we're so glad you're here.
set us free. Love is the answer. Gardeners, join me in prayer. <clears throat> Good morning, Lord. Great is your faithfulness and your steadfast love. Your mercies are made new every morning. I don't know what's going to happen today, but you do. So I give this day to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and energize me for your work. Awaken me to wonder of your salvation and quicken my spirit to your presence in my life. This day is yours. My body is yours. My mind is yours. Everything I am is yours. You will be faithful to complete the good work you've started. And as one step out into my day, I declare your sovereignty over every area of my life. I entrust myself to you and ask that you use me however you see fit to do good. May you be pleased with me today. Amen.
Each day we get more information about the virus and what our next steps are. And at times it can get confusing. There's sometimes instructions that can be contradicting. As I listen, I can't help but think, come on guys, can't we just get back to basics? So many new ideas or complicated details and it's all changing so very quickly. As people of faith, I believe that there are some basic practices that we can take with us into this brave new world. The reluctant founder of Methodism, John Wesley, wrote uh, some general rules, but three specific rules, which Reuben Job called three simple rules. The rules we can apply to our everyday life and not only live in a way that honors God, but it encourages growth and development of our faith Today, more than ever, I think it's important that people of faith are mindful of what is exactly guiding us on this journey. So join us again this week as we explore these three simple rules to do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Today, our focus is the second rule, to do good. It simply focuses our attention on the choices and actions we make doing good to others. This is not simply referring to random acts of kindness or paying it forward, but it's a way of attuning our heart, our conscience, and our life with what God would have us do to increase goodness for all. As we continue this series, I have a recommendation for a new mantra we gardeners can adopt. It's from Wesley himself, and it captures the true essence of this next rule to do good. Wesley said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Today we look at the second rule, do good. Let us pray. God, help us to become masters of ourselves that we might be the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them, our lips and speak through them, and take our hearts and set them on fire to do good. Amen. This past week, I had a tire pressure light come on in my car. Andrew noted it and he said it really wasn't much to be concerned about because it was really only short about five pounds of air and it could wait. Yet, you know, every time I got into that car and I started it up, there it was, that light, reminding me of that tire right there in the back that needed some attention. Sure enough, after I paid attention to the needs to put some air in the tire, the warning light went off and I didn't have another thought about it. In 2020, we live in a world where we actually have set up life in ways that we do get these warning lights to remind us of the different things that we need to do or things that need our attention. With the pandemic and less time in the office together, Martha has set up a system for all of us that's helping us to communicate in ways that remind us what we need to do. And even better, it reminds us what we need from one another. I get notices that say things like, Erica needs words from Carolyn or Vicki needs committee reports. It reminds me, in order for us to do our jobs effectively, we need to support one another in different ways. Not only do we live in a world where we get these visual reminders, we get lots of audible reminders as well these days. From new text messages to emails, there's always some kind of ding or bing or something that reminds me that there's some kind of new information coming in. Another fancy gadget I have on my car is this auto lane uh, warning system that when I get out of my lane, it goes beep, 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 beep. Or if I want to change lanes, it lets me know if there's a car in my blind spot with beep, 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 beep. These are great resources that are helping us in a lot of different ways to not only support one another, but to stay safe as well. As we continue the journey of looking at Wesley's three simple rules, I'm wondering if we had an occasion this past week to remember and to live into the lesson to do no harm, or what 
could we truly do to take the lesson this week into our hearts and into our lives to do good? What kind of impact would that have in our household, in our neighborhood, and in this world? If only God provided a warning light, right, that would come on when I'm doing harm. I'm wondering if that would make a difference in my behavior. Or if there was a beep, beep, beep that went off when I was about to spout at my husband or I was getting frustrated by someone else's behavior, particularly in the car. If we had a warning that came up before we posted something in response to something that someone else said or sent an email, I wonder if we had a warning that said, hey, is this going to do harm or is this going to do good? I wonder what difference that would make. In many ways, I think we actually do have a warning signal. That's our conscience and our heart. I mean, if we really take the time to look within, we can see when we are doing harm. Yet, just like all those other gadgets we have on the car and on the phone, I think in some ways it gets just to be noise and we ignore those warning signals and don't pay attention like we could to that spirit. We get numb or even lazy and think about only ourselves and what's easiest, what's the easiest path to take or the path of least resistance. We consider, well, what's best for me? So we at times, we do ignore looking deep within forgetting we are a people of faith and called to do no harm and to do good. We just move along, not looking to see how we're impacting others with our behavior. Jesus taught us about warning signs, about staying in our own lane and about doing good in the world. In fact, over and over again in scripture, he says, listen, or he reminds us what has been said that provides us the best direction. When it comes to doing good, he said this. In Matthew 5, he said, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, stay in your own lane, loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you so that you may be children of God in heaven. For God makes the sun rise on evil and on good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, I think Jesus is saying, don't let your behavior be influenced by outside sources. Instead, look within to your heart and your conscience and do the right thing. Do good. In many ways, I think that is exactly what Jesus is saying throughout the Bible. No matter what's going on around you, be the person that God has called you to be and just do good. John the Evangelist puts it this way. He says this in 3 John 1, do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. Whoever does good is from God. Paul talked about overcoming evil with good and makes it clear in Romans when he says, and we know that those who love God, we work for good according to God's purpose. John Wesley took this call to do good very seriously. He lived knowing that faith without works, well, that's not really faith. He worked in ways that made a real difference in the community. He visited and worked with the poor. He and the members of his Oxford Holy Club assisted at schools and helped in workplaces. John Wesley, along with his brother Charles, visited prisons, preaching, and setting up pastoral care circles as well, helping those with rehabilitation of prisoners. Wesley was one of the very first to set up a re-entry program for ex-offenders. Wesley took very seriously the call to care for one another, body, mind, and spirit. In his later life, John Wesley learned about medicine and he grew medicinal plants to help those who couldn't afford medical care. He tended to the spirits of the marginalized, for coal miners to factory workers who could not make it uh, into a church. He would simply show up and preach out at the side of the mines and workhouses. Not only that, but Wesley was one of the first micro loan business providers. He would often provide looms and weaving materials and bits of wool so folks could 
start and even maintain a productive business. Wesley had the ability to make a difference in these areas because he saw and heard the warning signs. He found a group of people to provide support and together they had a great impact on the community. So how does that translate to us some 300 years later? How can we do good? I mean, there are so many needs out there that it can become overwhelming and it wears us out and we think we can't make a difference. This past week, many of us had the opportunity to start Dr. Brenda Lyons' class, Haven't You Suffered Enough? And in this class, she reminds us of the power of language and how often we use language that makes it impossible to address something. For example, if you say, I am overwhelmed, I mean, what can you do with that? What if you changed overwhelmed to I'm overloaded? Then you could start looking at what is overloading you and start offloading some of that. Here is an example of how that can work. Roberts Park was surrounded by homeless some 25 years ago. So on Sundays, they decided they could be a place that could provide a meal. And so some people came together and they engaged in providing meals on Sundays for the homeless. Over the years, that small group of people, well, they asked for some help. And over the years, churches have come to help, including the garden we're serving today at 1130. And how do we do that? Well, we do it one lunch at a time. And together as a community of faith, we're gonna feed about 150 people, a few sandwiches at a time. So rather than being overwhelmed, Let's start doing good by thinking small. I imagine that every single day there are ways that we can reflect God's light in our own families and communities and in this world. We can do it as we go about our daily routine. One of my favorite Mother Teresa quotes is this one. Not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Now, don't get me wrong, doing good can be a big task and we're called to do this good in a challenging and changing environment. In a time when there is real risk out there, God is asking us to do good, creating a permanent change in the world. So what are some of the bigger acts of doing good? We need some goodness to address racial inequity, homelessness, property situations, education, addiction, and when you start listing it, well, it can be overwhelming, but wait, no, we're just overloaded. And we can start to address these concerns, one sandwich, one conversation, one home, one class, one recovery program at a time, just doing a little bit of good here and there. We discussed last week, these rules are simple, but they're not easy. Doing good is very difficult. Ruben Job writes this, the truth is that my gift of goodness may be rejected, ridiculed, and misused, but my desire to do good is not limited by the thoughts or actions of others. My desire to do good is in response to God's invitation to follow Jesus, and it is in my control. I can determine to, ex to extend hospitality and goodness to all I meet. I can decide to do good to all, even to those who disagree with me and turn against what I believe is right and good. And the reward for my doing good is not canceled or diminished by the response to my acts of goodness. I will have the reward of knowing I did what was right and pleasing to God. I will still be identified, known, and loved as a child of God. What could be a greater reward than this? My dear friends, let's not talk about love and doing good. Let's practice real love and do good, offloading the burden one sandwich at a time, one conversation at a time, believing in the power of hope and in God's amazing grace and goodness. Amen. everybody welcome to stepping stones for our garden kids uh, it's been a while since I've talked to you but in the last few times that we've been together we've talked about things about 
that God wants us to do. Like God wants us to treat people kindly and to pay it forward when someone is kind to us. And we also talked about how God wants us to love our neighbors and to treat them the way that we want to be treated. But guess what? God's not done with us. God wants us to be kind not only to the people who are good to us, but also to the people who don't treat us well. Maybe somebody who's annoying to us or who's kind of mean to us. And that's a really, really hard thing to do. It's easy to love our family and friends, but to love somebody who's mean to us, that's a big task. When somebody is mean to us, usually our first reaction is to get angry. And maybe we say something mean back to them if they've said something mean to us. That's not how God wants us to be. He wants us to have a good heart and to treat people with kindness so that we can have a more peaceful world. I was getting ready for this talk today and I read an example that's kind of silly, but I think it might get the point across. Let's say that you're in the kitchen with your mom and your mom is cooking fish for dinner and cabbage and onions. And that kitchen smells really, really bad. But your mom knows what to do. She grabs her handy can of air pressure and goes, and guess what? It clears the air and things are fresh again. Well, sometimes in life when we find ourselves in a stinky situation and maybe somebody has done something mean or said something mean to us, if we can do what God asks us to and react with kindness and a loving heart, guess what? We clear the air and it makes things better. So remember, this week, if you find yourself in a stinky situation, spray that love and it'll make the world a better place. Let's bow our heads and have a prayer. God, please teach us to be able to teach us to be kind to people who are not so kind to us. Watch over our garden family and help everyone to be well and safe this week. Amen. All right, everybody, it's that time. Put your arms out, cross your forearms, put your hands on your shoulders, and give yourselves a hug from me. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Go now in peace, my dear friends, and may the love of God be yours today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And hey, I've just got two words for you. Do good. Amen.